Hey, you're listening to Can I Say That? with Brenna and Austin Blaine. Hey, you guys. This week on the podcast, we are talking about fear, anxiety, and seeking peace. And maybe you're like, hey, Brenna, I thought we already did an episode on anxiety. And you are right. About two years ago, one of our first episodes that we did was an episode with my friend, Allie Gadbot, and she shared about her personal walk and struggle with anxiety. And we looked at anxiety through the lens of, is it a sin or not? When God says, do not fear, do not be anxious, what does that mean for people who struggle with chronic anxiety or who have an anxiety disorder? But this episode, I want to specifically focus on an aspect of fear and anxiety that scripture often speaks to. And that's not to say that scripture doesn't speak to anxiety disorders, but I think there's something really specific about this last year with COVID and everything that's happened where there are a lot of people who do not chronically struggle with anxiety or do not have an anxiety disorder who have found themselves in a season or a time or even just moments of anxiety. What does scripture have to say to us? And then is there a way that we can step out of that anxiety and step out of that fear and trust God and trust what the scripture says? And if so, how the heck do we do that? So for this episode, I was really excited to get the opportunity to interview someone who I have followed for a few years now. Her name is Trillia Newbell, and she is not only an author, and by the way, she writes amazing books about ethnicity, so I'd check those out, but she is also a speaker, and um, something that's kind of fun is she just this last, in the last few weeks, was at the Gospel Coalition's Women's Conference, and so... I find that oftentimes when the Gospel Coalition invites someone to be on their platform, that person has a really significant viewpoint and voice to share. So I'm really excited for you guys to hear from her. If you find this episode helpful to yourself or maybe you think of someone like, man, my friend could really use this episode, I would love to invite you to share about this episode or even any past episodes that we've done on your social media. Every time that you share about us on social media, our circle grows and we are super thankful for that. Also, if you use a platform, because I know there are other platforms aside from Apple, that allows you to leave a review, when you leave a kind and encouraging review, that does a lot for your favorite podcast. Not just for us, but for all podcasts. When you leave a positive and encouraging review, not only does that affect algorithms, but it also signals to other people, hey, there might be something of worth here. So I'd love to invite you to support us in those two easy ways. And I hope that you find today's podcast timely and encouraging. All right, so something that I've noticed recently kind of in the in the Christian world, if you will, is people are starting to use this term that Christians are called to be the non-anxious presence of Christ. I just want that to be my first question. Are Christians called to be the non-anxious presence of Christ in this world? And if so, where do we see this in scripture and what even does that mean? (laughs) That's really interesting because I have never once heard that. So I didn't know that that was a phrase to be the non-anxious presence anxious presence. And I'm assuming that people are saying that because we live in an anxious time, like everything around us is um, anxiety inducing, but not just that. I mean, it is just like one thing after another that is um, difficult. So, so I'm assuming that that's where that phrase comes. But if we look at scripture, having not really been diving into the topic of anxiety in a while. I know that that we've got Philippians 4, 6, do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, um, by prayer and petition, give thanksgiving and submit those requests to the Lord. And then we know in 
in the gospels. I can't, I believe definitely Matthew, but I can't remember where else, um, where it says, do not be anxious about anything, but that the, the Lord provides for the lilies. He's going to provide for you. So there's, there's so much in the text where, where God is calling us to lean, not on our own understanding, but to lean on him and to fix our eyes on him, that I could see why they would say, do not be anxious. And to show the Lord that we can have peace because God is our peace and God gives us peace. But I say that with a, a bit of caution, we don't want to, there, there's different types of anxiety. So there's the everyday anxiety that we must every single day cast our cares onto the Lord because his burden is easy, right? His his burden is light. He can carry those, those anxieties. We cast it every single day. So we want to have a peace that when people look at us, they they can say, okay, there's there's something you can say, I'm leaning on Jesus. Yet there's also a diagnosed anxiety, which I think we've got to be real careful not to try to slap a scripture on something that could be some sort of imbalance or sort of some some something that is diagnosed. There's there could be something else going on, um, whether it's a mental illness, who, who knows what it is. So that would need medicine maybe. So I, I'm real careful with when we're talking about things, especially that that can also be clinical, that we we are that we t- make sure we know what we're talking about. So when I'm talking about anxiety, I'm typically talking about that everyday anxiety that we all can experience from time to time that God calls us to cast all of our cares on onto him for. But there are times when people wake up and there's nothing wrong and they're anxious and they have, there is something else that's, that may need medical or clinical or, or, or a therapist. It's kind of a deeper, deeper thing going on that needs more attention. And Yet they too can cast their cares onto the Lord um, because he's, he's a great physician and he cares for them and cares for everything, all of these things. But I just am real careful with those distinctions. Something that I think a lot of people do that I've done myself is when I'm talking to people, sometimes I find that I interchange the words fear and anxiety. But I'm wondering if when we look at scripture, is there a difference between fear and anxiety? And if so, What are those differences and why do they matter? Well, that's a great question. I I believe it's said that do not fear is maybe the greatest commandment in scripture. Like not greatest as in he's called it the great, the the most said, like do not fear. So I I think anxiety and fear, I I believe that they are distinct because I, I think you can be anxious and not necessarily fearful. So for example, some some days I wake up and I'm like, oh my goodness, I have so much to do. I'm not afraid of all the things I have to do, but it can cause me to be anxious because I it's like pile on. Oh, I've got to do this and I need to do this. Um, maybe if you wanted to dig deeper, you could see a, a fear of disappointment or fear of, I, I don't know. But that probably is just toiling with anxiety rather than casting my cares onto the Lord. Where fear, you I mean, you can be afraid of people, you can be afraid of your future, you can be afraid of, gosh, a number of different things. And so the Lord is constantly telling us, do not fear um, because the Lord is at hand. And so so I would say that they are two different things. And I can't remember what else you asked, <laughs> but that's the answer to that one statement. You answered you answered my question. Okay. So something that someone asked on from our audience was in what ways does fear drive us to seek control? And then how is that damaging not only to our own lives but also to our relationship and our reliance on Christ? What a great audience question. I'm going to just give you an example with the pandemic that we <laughs> One of the things I thought I really trusted the Lord until everything shut down. <laughs> and what I realized is that I kind of trusted in a system and trusted, even though I know tomorrow's not promised for anything and they, where the scriptures say, do not worry about tomorrow because today has enough worries of his own. Well, I believe that to be true, but I really feel like it was all kind of tested. 
as things started shutting down and I didn't know whether I could go to the grocery store, if I could, if our kids were going to be in school or if they weren't, there were so many unknowns Um, whether I was going to walk out of my house and die immediately. That's just, that's how I felt like what's going on. And what I realized is that I really, I think I trusted in my own control. Like I, I felt like I, I, I kind of knew what tomorrow would bring, even though I, the scriptures say otherwise, because every day it was pretty much the same kind of, you know? So when we try to, um, well, one, I think what we're saying to God is that we are God if we're trying to be in control because we, we have, we are in control and we can't be in control and we will never be in control. So when we are trying to take control or you even see, hear those phrases, take control of your life. (laughs) And there's, there's some things you can do that's truth to that, like self-control and various things. But really, I think what we're saying is I'm, I'm God. And I know best and I know what's best for my life and I know what's best for my future. And so often I think when we try to take control, we end up anxious and fearful and disappointed and, and, and really not trusting in this sovereign, good, holy, just God. I mean, I I think we just, what it says to us when we try to take control is that or what we're saying about the Lord is that we don't trust him and he's not trustworthy. And so for me, I had to kind of wrestle with that. Like, okay, Lord, do I trust you for tomorrow? Do I trust that you have this under control and that you are good? Like your word says, all things work together for good. So do I believe that you're going to work this together for good? Whatever that means, that doesn't, it's not a promise of wealth or that's not, (laughs) it's, whatever that means that could be through suffering. So I have to trust him and lay, lay my life down before him and open my hands and say, Lord, whatever your will be done and pray that, that he will keep me, which he will, as he's, as he's doing whatever he's doing. So I think control is a very difficult we don't realize how much we try to control until I think that control is taken away. You are a parent to two beautiful children. And I'm just wondering, I think parenting is such a unique experience, especially when it comes to anxiety. So I'm just wondering, what are a few maybe daily anxieties that you have to wrestle with as being a parent? And then maybe even some situational anxieties you have to deal with as being a parent. And then in response to that, what have you also learned about the father heart of God through being a parent? That is... There's a lot in that question. And I, so where do I start? I think the moment I got pregnant, I had to deal with anxiety. Um, So it wasn't, I've had four miscarriages. And so just that alone is such, so a fear. I I would be filled with fear and I would have to lay it before the Lord. God, am I going to get to see these children? And so it was, it was very difficult, um, even through pregnancy. And then when they're born, I mean, I can't, every step of the way in raising and caring for another human being is terrifying. (laughs) It's just like, Lord, help me. I am, I have never felt more desperate for God than trying to raise these kids. And so you asked for everyday examples. I would just, I mean, when when my children were born, you hear of all these crazy things that could happen um, from SIDS to, which is a sudden infant death syndrome. It's just terrible. And I know people who've experienced it to whooping cough. There's all these things. So from the beginning, I'm entrusting their health. I'm asking, so I I would do things like, especially when my first, when my second was born, it was so different. But when my first was born, he would be sleeping through the night, but I would be up peeking at him, just making sure he's still breathing, just looking. It was terrible, you know, this, so I had to finally say, okay, I'm, I need to rest so that I can care for him and I have to entrust his life to the Lord. So those are these little things that you think, 
you just, it's, it's interesting. But then they start doing things like interacting with people and, and our kids are in school and learning all these things. And so you have to trust that the Lord will, will guard their hearts, guard their minds, guard them from people doing unkind things to them. So, so I don't know even where to begin with that question (laughs) because it really starts from the moment you conceive. I just believe that that entrusting the life of your child to the Lord and that they would be grow in the knowledge of him. It begins at the beginning. I, I remember even one time, one of the things that the Lord did that was just so helpful for me is early on, I recognized that I could not save my son. We were driving and I asked him something about the Lord or our singing. And he said something like, I don't believe you. And I, he was four. And I was like, you don't believe me. What are you talking about? He said, well, I don't believe you. I don't believe there's a God. Where is God? And I was like, uh. <laughs> and so I'm like trying to think of something to say. And to make a really long story short, he was relating to like action figures. So he's like, well, where's God? There's Superman, Spider-Man. He's naming all these things. Where's God? And I said to him, well, buddy, I can't make God appear, though I wish he would have at the moment. <laughs> I was like, where's the burning bush? But I I was like, I can't make him appear, but I can pray that you will one day believe. And he said, okay. And I said, okay. But one of the things that God did for me there is, I mean, recognize that I can't save my son. I, I can share with him, but I can't save him. God has to do that. So how has God, I, I think you asked me, is God being the father um, helped with my parenting? Well, I lost my dad at the age of 19. And one of the first things that the Lord did for me is really drill into my heart the doctrine of adoption and that I am adopted into his family, that I'm an heir with Christ, that I I could approach him as my Abba Father and that I could talk, speak to him. And so There is a tenderness and everyone's father was different. My father was tender and was gentle and was my best friend. And so as when I became a Christian and and I realized that God isn't just this like way off, he's holy, he's just, he's all those things, but he's also draws near to us. He's gentle. He's loving, he's kind, he cares, he sings over us. I have um, tried to reflect those things with my kids. I try to delight in them and enjoy them and and develop a relationship with them where they can come to me and tell me anything. Um, there's limits, of course, because I am a limited human being and I sin against them and God never sins and God never, never does anything wrong. But, um, but that's the way that I am trying to love and res- and and care for my kids, the way that God has loved and cares for me. And so it is, it's a really such a beautiful thing to get to parent these, these kids. So I'm really grateful, but it's loaded with anxiety. <laughs> Yeah. I was going to use this segue to talk about something that I find really interesting about you is that your social media presence is so joyful and to me so non-anxious. When I look at how you interact with people on Twitter and just even what you post on Instagram, I think there's just something about you that I think draws people in and it makes people go, okay, what does she believe or who does she know? And But then also just hearing you share about being a parent and everything like that, I have to ask, what spiritual practices have you found to be greatly impactful when it comes to practicing reliance on God? Because I I hear you talk about how that's a daily thing for you. That would be my first question. And then just a follow-up question would be, are there practices that Jesus calls us to participate in daily that combat fear? Mm. Well, First of all, thanks for the encouragement regarding social media. I really do want to be a light. And so that encourages me. I, I practice really what I see Jesus doing things like pulling away. So 
trying to have a Sabbath and resting um, as God did. I mean, he created and he rested and prayer, like Jesus himself went away to pray. And th- so this is answering both questions, by the way. <laughs> and reading the scriptures, I, I, in order to really get to know God, he revealed himself in his words. So I want to lean in on that and learn about him through his word. And, and it helps me also know how to live right in this world. And then, um, so I would say Sabbath rest, prayer, really everything, the the ordinary stuff, right? Sabbath, (laughs) the the ordinary stuff of life kind of helps me. Prayer, reading my Bible, pulling away in a Sabbath rest, so resting. And then something else that isn't practiced a ton in our wild and crazy loud world is being silent. So trying to find time to not listen to anything, not hear it, just be silent with the Lord, I think has been something that's been a unique practice for me. Um, And then I would, and, and these are the things that I see in scripture, fasting, which I wish I, I, I cannot say that I do as, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not frequent as I wish, but fasting is, you see that in the scriptures. And so I am practicing just the ordinary things that people have done for centuries. Another thing I try to do is to to preach the gospel to myself, which I believe Jerry Bridges, who is an author, he coined that phrase. So that is a, that's a daily thing, especially because I wear all my sin (laughs) on the outside. So and so I have to remind my heart of the gospel, repent. I think that's a spiritual practice. Um, the scriptures say, if we confess our sin, he's faithful and just to forgive us and to purify us. And so I want to be a repenting person. So so these are those sort of the things that I do that kind of help me keep walking in my faith. And, and does it combat fear? Well, I mean, I think when... Whenever you're relying, I I think it helps me rely on God so that when I fear, because I will fear, it's not if I fear or it's when I will fear or when I will be anxious or, you know, I I think I know where to run. And it's, I do think it's like a muscle for me. I can atrophy pretty quickly. My, my, I can gain muscle quickly, but I can also, if I sit for long for long enough, my muscles, they, they will soften. And, and so I believe these spiritual disciplines are like that muscle. If you, if you soften, if you stop doing it for, for a while, you forget, you forget where to run. Um, you will forget truth. I think you could likely be more discouraged. So it's a muscle that you have to keep practicing, not because it earns any favor, but because you're desperate for the Lord. And I don't know, for me, I think it's about delight also. <laughs> like you, it's a joy to get to know the Lord. It's a joy that we know the creator of the universe and we get to talk to him. That's amazing to me. So I just want, I, I long for all of us and myself included to, to be in that kind of abiding relationship where we enjoy our, our savior and our friend, Jesus. And so that's some of the, the things I do and the reason, that's not the reason behind it, but it is one way that it helps fight some of the fear and anxiety. In in this era of social media, I think there's been this kind of this learning curve for Christians. And I, when I think about the question I'm about to ask, I kind of think about growing up and how when we're young, we, we cry out to our parents when we need something or when we're scared or we're fearful. And then as we get older, we kind of learn this sense of almost like discernment about who do we cry out to. And I think sometimes there's almost like a shame about, well, I don't want to cry out in front of certain people. But then I also think there's, again, a discernment and a wisdom about who do we cry out in front of? What I'm what I'm really getting at is what does our reaction to fear say to the world around us? And how does that play into our witness? 
I think that, okay, when you're saying cry out, it, it all depends on what you're crying out about, right? So there are things that we, you may, not, if you were sexually assaulted, for example, you may not want to post that. That may be something you, you, you have to discern for yourself what you can handle because of the onslaught of people saying crazy things. People are not, sometimes people will be gentle and kind and wise with their words. Other times people will shame you or make you feel terrible. So it just, I think you've got to be discerning about what you are going to share and how you share it. So I think there's a wisdom there. Also, I do think one of the dangers of social media is that we think we have to, because there's this thing like, uh, you don't want to be fake, right? So you think people will pendulum swing. They'll, they'll either be showing, you know, they're, they want people to think one way of them. So they might show just the only the, the happy things and which, okay. But then you can, you can swing the other way and share things that you really need someone who loves you to care for you in your local community. And so I think we can, we, we have to be really discerning and careful about what we share. So now that I've said that, I do think it is good when, when people in the watching world see the, the, the Christian struggle and see where they're placing their hope. I mean, I, I think that is because that's the reality of our life. And I think it can communicate another gospel or the prosperity gospel if all we do is talk about our ups and everything is beautiful and wonderful and no one ever sees the real struggle of life, that we're sorrowful yet always rejoicing, that we we have to give our even our hopes and our dreams to the Lord. I, I just think that, that they that people get a false idea of what the Christian life is like if we're not just being real and being open and being honest. With that said, I like remember the caveat that I gave you at the beginning. But I do think that showing the broken parts of our lives, also the hope of Christ tells the world that, oh, Jesus came for the sick. <laughs> That's what he said, right? He didn't, he didn't come for the righteous. He came for us, those who need him, those who have just the same old broken, broken hard lives as everyone else. So, so I do think that it's really good just to be honest. Honest is the key. Now, wh whether you want to share all your stuff or not, that's a different conversation, but honest I think it can always be helpful. When I think about the pandemic and all the decisions people had to deal with, especially when it comes to jobs or even young students when they're like, man, am I, am I going to go to college? What am I going to do? I think a lot over the last, last year and a half of the decisions we have made have been kind of based on anxiety or fear. But as Christians, when we make decisions, should peace be the driving factor as opposed to anxiety or fear? Or is there some merit in allowing anxiety and fear to have a balance or a pull with when we make those decisions? Yeah. So are you talking about everyday decisions, things like a job, or are you talking about do I walk down this dark alley? Because I think those are two very distinct, <laughs> you know? And so I think there's wisdom. Sometimes fear is a beacon. It's like, do not do this. Do not do this. God's way of saying, hey, maybe you don't walk down that dark alley at one o'clock in the morning by yourself. Maybe you turn around. Maybe that's discernment. And that kind of check isn't a fear that you're not trusting the Lord. <laughs> Okay, I'm I'm laughing because Christians can be really funny about this. <laughs> like we can, it. I, I don't know who it was. Someone recently told me this story, and I have no idea where it comes from. But and it is a little cheesy. But they, this guy was stuck on a mountain. This is a this is an illustration. A guy was stuck on the mountain, and he was praying for rescue. He's like, Lord, I need to be rescued. And someone in a helicopter came by or something like that. And he was like, come on in. I'm here. I can. And he said something like, oh, no, I'm praying 
thank God to rescue me. <laughs> and then here comes someone with some other flying device. Okay, so you get the point where I'm going. There's this funny thing that we do when we're trying to make decisions or we're trying to, we're waiting for like this big flashing light. And sometimes God's like, hey, I I gave you a yes. Maybe that's all you need to step into that. All that to say, that, that's kind of, I'm, I'm, in, I'm saying more than what you asked for, because I think with, when it comes to making decisions, we can over, I think sometimes we can overthink it. So for example, if the fear is driving you, if there's something in your spirit that's like, you know what, I shouldn't go that route, then don't go that route <laughs> and entrust it to the Lord, um, like the dark alley. But there are other times when it's, if you're thinking of where do I live or the job, I think you can pray, Lord, make it clear. And it, he's not, he may not be all of a sudden you open your Bible and there's this scripture verse that says, go and do. Um, it may be that the employers and gave you a job and that may be your answer. Um, or you found a church in that a location where you're trying to go and that may be your answer. So can fear and anxiety, does it have a place in our decisions? I would say depends. I would say anytime you're not trusting God, I think that's sin. I think we, we always want to be trusting God, but there is an emotion about fear that I think isn't always sinful. So it could be kind of the way that the Lord is kind of given you, hey, maybe you can question this a little bit more, a kind of a check. So so it all depends on how it's being exercised. I do think that anxiety, typically it is something that should be fought against because the scriptures are so, it just seems so clear. And of course, fear too, except that I I just, I think that, that sometimes we can mix fear with a, a caution. And so we've got to really be able to define what is motivating us. All in all, I would say, trust the Lord if it's something like a job or, and, and ask for, ask for help. We don't have to live in a vacuum. We, we have a community. We ask for help and ask people to help you discern what that next step is. You gave us a great list of spiritual practices that Jesus calls us to step into that help us to work through our anxiety. But I know that there are some people who just get into either a really specific time of anxiety or they live in seasons of fear and anxiety. I'm just wondering, how can we recognize God's presence in our life during those times? I'll give you a time when I experienced it. After my second miscarriage, I remember being just so despondent. I was so discouraged and so fearful about ever getting pregnant again. I just, it was terrible. It was a, ter- it was a struggle. And I couldn't really open my Bible. I just felt so wasted and just tired. So I remember one day that I was I was in bed and I was just like, Lord, help me, please. And because I was just so sad. And and you know where the scriptures say that the, the Lord draws near to the brokenhearted. I I felt his presence and he he would rem- he reminded me of scripture. I believe his spirit was bring bringing scripture to mind, and and I I think at that moment I realized he really does draw near to us when we call out to him, and we draw near to him. He draws near to us, and he doesn't. That doesn't mean that we're going to be doing all these things, but I do think that because I had been in his word, I had I could recall his word, right? Because I had already been doing those practices, that the Lord, it was, it w- I could recall things that ministered to my own heart when I needed Him, and the mind fixed on Him is at peace. That's what the, and so if that's that's what I was experiencing, so I would I would just say there are seasons of anxiety and fear. The Lord, he, he, he promises to draw near. And so I would just encourage anyone who's experiencing that to call out to him. 
and ask him ask him for help for his presence and to be near to you and then to ask him to for you to believe that he is that he is near that he does care that he is understands your sorrow jesus was a man of sorrows that he that he gets it and but sometimes i think what happens in those seasons is we can struggle with unbelief so we need to ask God that, okay, you tell me I can do these things. I can call out to you and that you're going to draw near to me. Am I going to believe it? I want to believe, help my unbelief, Lord, so that I can know that you are near me, even if my feelings don't match. So Trillia, before we end, if I'm not mistaken, you have two recently new written books, one, A Great Cloud of Witnesses, and then the other, Creative God, Colorful Us. Can you just tell us a little bit about both books and where we can find them? Yeah. Well, thank you. Okay. So Creative God, Colorful Us is about God's delightfully different family for the middle grade ages. So ages, it's really eight to 12, but it can be six to 12 if if you read with them. So it's a chapter book on um, about the beauty of diversity, but also it's it's gospel and how we can have love our neighbors as ourselves, those relationships that we long to have of people of all ethnicities and backgrounds. So that's Creative God, Colorful Us. And then A Great Cloud of Witnesses is a Bible study. It's a six week, you can extend it to eight, study on Hebrews 11. So it's all about the Hall of Fame of Faith. And, and that was a joy to write. <laughs> Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you want to learn more about Can I Say That? Our guests on the show or submit questions and participate in polls, please join us on Instagram at Can I Say That Show. We love interacting with our audience and hearing how this show has affected, changed, and challenged you in your own walk. So please join us.